Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Nine, and we'll continue our series on miracles in the life and ministry of Jesus. We have taken up that there are a number of other places in the Bible where miracles are are recorded. We gave a definition of a miracle, that it be a suspension of nature, not something done normally or naturally. How many of you saw the, the couple who went scuba diving <clears throat> out in the Caribbean uh, just a few days ago? Uh, 38 hours they were lost at sea. I've been on a couple of those group trips. I shuddered to think that but in that 30 minutes that they were down 60 feet deep or so, enjoying the coral reefs and the marine life, and it's just beautiful. I really enjoy it. Uh, I haven't done it for a number of years, but, uh, but I always just enjoy the peacefulness underneath the, the surface. When they came back up, the peacefulness was abruptly interrupted because a, a strong howling wind had come up and there were four or five foot waves. Four or five foot waves means when you're in the trough, that's about nine or 10 feet up there to the peak. And they couldn't see the rest of their group. They couldn't see the boat uh, and they got separated and they looked and searched and did circles and never found them and came back in without them. And they spent 38 hours at sea they stayed together. They, they said they were suffering hypothermia, sunburn, jellyfish stings, uh, and uh, they, they were exhausted. But the Coast Guard somehow flew right over top of them Amen. and found them Amen. and rescued them and brought them in. And that lady looked right at the camera and said, I want you to all know this. This is a miracle. It's a miracle. And I thought, boy, it really is because it's a whole lot worse than a needle in a haystack. That, that, that ocean is one big, big, big place. And they can't always predict where currents and tides and, and uh, wind and things are going to send you. Uh, but uh, as happy as I am uh, to report that they're both safe and recovering and very grateful and thankful, according to the dictionary definition of a miracle, that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit. This is something that can be attributed to nothing but God. This is something that has no human intervention whatsoever. It may have, listen carefully, it may have human participation, but it doesn't have human intervention. It has holy intervention, eternal intervention, God's intervention. It suspends all laws of nature. It's a suspension of the laws of nature. It's, it's the man swinging his axe and the head flies off and boosh in the river. I was fishing with someone this past week and they made a cast and half their reel came right off the side and went, you've had that happen? Isn't that a blast? No, it's not. It's a, it's a bad day, isn't it? You, you throw like this and half your reel goes, boosh. If I'd have thought quick enough, I'd have went over to the bank, broke off a stick, and threw it in the water. I don't think anything happened. The Lord wasn't involved at all. He needs to buy a new reel. This man flung his axe, and the head flew off, splashed. You think what you want, but I think it had something to do that he was working on a project for God. He's working to build the school of the prophet's house. And, and he said that axe was borrowed. And the prophet walked over and broke off a stick and threw it in the water. You imagine how many people. There's the preacher up there again. Here he's at it again. And, and, and he throws a stick in the water. What good is that going to do? The stick sank and the axe had floated. And he said to the man, we'll pick it up. That's what it says. He had to address the man. The man didn't just, hey, there it is. He, he just went. 
That doesn't happen every day. That's suspension of the laws of nature. If you have an accident, go throw it in the water and see if it floats. It's not going to. It's not, it happened that one time. We don't have any record or any evidence of it ever happening again. Ever. When we look at these miracles that have taken place, we see that commonly. That these are things that have never happened before, and we don't have any evidence of them ever happening again. And it started out here in the book of John, and it said this is the beginning of miracles, told about his first one. And then we read about the second one, and then the third, and the fourth. And now we're on the sixth miracle, and it's in John chapter 9, this man that had been born blind. And as we mentioned last week, it says, starting in verse 1, and Jesus passed by, and as Jesus passed by, that's a funny way to start a, a conversation, isn't it? And as Jesus passed by, we had to go back into the previous chapter and find out that he was being rejected. He was being resisted. He was being contended with. They were arguing with him. See, some people, you do something just for their own good. You just give them a piece of advisement or give them a piece of direction. And it's for their own benefit. And and they just resist you. And they say, you can't tell me what to do. And I'm going to do what I want anyway. And and you're not the boss of me. And you're just controlling. That's it. You're just domineering. You're just manipulative. Well, I'm going to do what I want, not what you want. And, And he's just trying to help them. But instead, they pick up stones to stone him, and, and they contend with him, and they argue with him, and they resist him, and, and he, he leaves. He passes through their midst. They're going to stone him to death, and he walks out. And as he walks by, here we go. That's how chapter 8 ends. They pick up stones to stone him, and he conceals himself and goes through the temple and through their midst and passed by. And as he passed by, you see it now? This is just a continuation, and read it contextually. They're going to stone him, never a pleasant experience, and usually only have it once. And he, and, he, and he conceals himself, and then he passes through their midst. And as he walks by, he sees this man who's born blind. Now, how many people do you know that care enough about people? See, this is Christianity in its exercise. That we're not so consumed with our struggles and our own trials and our, our own issues and our own battles and what's going on in our life. And, and, well, you don't know what I'm going through. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> We, we don't get so caught up in ourself and in our own struggles and battles that when we see someone else that needs help, we won't stop. Consider earlier here in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke, and, and we know it as the account of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan was number three. Not all about the Good Samaritans, it's about the religious folk who were too busy with things to do and places to go and people to see, and they were so caught up and consumed with their own life. And they went by, and that's no business of mine, so he got beat up, so he's bleeding to death, so he's he's naked, they took even his clothes, they took everything from him, so what? What's that got to do with me? And it clearly says that he walked by on the other side. That means they crossed the road, want to soothe my own conscience, la, 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 and, and left him there. The third one by saw him, got down off of his, off of his ride, his, his whatever he was riding, donkey, ox, whatever it was, horse, and went down and took oil and wine and poured him in, bound up his wounds, put him on his, his uh, beast of burden, <clears throat> took him to the hotel, paid for two days' stay, said, when I come back, if he stayed longer than that, I'll take care of it when I return. That was all in response to a question. Who's my neighbor? And he responded with that account and then said, which of these was neighbor to him that was in need? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? That means don't get so caught up with what's happening in your life that you forget to help other people in their struggles. So we we, we got that out of the first third of verse 1. And as he passed by, he saw... What did he saw? He saw a man that was born blind from birth. Born blind from birth. Now, we, we, read, we read down farther that uh, verse 32, it says, Since the world began, it's never been heard that a man opened the eyes of one who was born blind. 
And so again, uh, if this is the very first time this has ever happened, okay, don't let that derail your faith. Don't that, that rob you of your hope of the, of the living God, the eternal God doing something mighty and something powerful and something supernatural uh, on your behalf just because it's never happened to anyone else. It's never happened to this man. Let's see what happens to him. Verse 3, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 2, the disciples ask a question. Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? See, they made an assumption, and th this, th this ought to be a great lesson to all of us. Jesus, what's the first word of his answer? Neither. Neither. They made an assumption. One translation even says, this blindness, is it a result of his parents' sin or this man himself? Some people's troubles are a result of their own sin. And the quickest way through it is just get on your knees and say, I sinned, forgive me. The longest way through it is to continue to defend yourself and make excuse and say, well, it really wasn't that bad, or I really didn't do it, or it wasn't my fault. It was the man. It was the woman you gave me. It was, it was the, 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 the serpent. She shouldn't have been naked out there on the rooftop anyway. David didn't make that excuse. David just said, I have sinned. That's, that's what he said. And the prophet said, you shall not die. The quickest way through is take ownership. Yes. Yes. Admit your mistakes, confess your faults, and confess your sins, and he'll be forgiven. Make excuses for your sin, and the Bible just calls that <clears throat> fig leafing it. They didn't come running out and say, oh God, oh God, oh God, we blew it. We, we disobeyed you. We shouldn't have ever been there in the first place. See, if you're not under the fruit tree... If you're not standing there staring at it, why, why even go that close to the fruit tree? And the serpent comes up and says, did God say? First thing he'll always do, question the word, question what God spoke. Did God say you couldn't? Eat it? But that was after she was there standing there looking at it. And she stared at it, she looked at it, and saw that it was good for food and, and that it would make one wise, and reached out and touched it. Nothing happened. Can't be that bad. Some challenge, some difficulty, some conditions are a result of sin. Don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. Whatsoever a man... That shall he also, and he that sows what? To his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's a slow, steady decay unto death. How about these verses? How about you'll want to hold your place in John 9 and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Huh. For this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many have died. What? That's not in the Bible. Let's see if it's in yours. Open it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, make such a big deal about examining yourself, but it's not that big of a deal in the Bible. Really? Really? I had, so, I, I, I've, I've had somebody write me that. Not recently, but a number of years ago. You make such a big deal about examining yourself. It's not that big of a deal in the Bible. Really? Huh. Let's start reading in verse 27. See if it's a big deal. I guess if you don't mind dying or being sickly. Whoever, therefore, this is a whosoever verse in the Bible, so make sure you got this one on your list of whosoever verses. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's love of the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him, not perish ever last night. And this one, whosoever shall eat unworthy in an unworthy manner or fashion and drink this cup 
unworthily, in an unworthy manner or fashion, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Therefore, let each man examine himself. Then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh in an unworthy manner or fashion, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sick among you, and many have died early. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Hey, better to get sick or die early and still make heaven than go to hell for eternity. Yeah, that's in your Bible right here, New Testament, for this cause. For this cause. Go back to James chapter 5. Pastor, why are you preaching this? Number one, because it's in the Bible. Yes. Number two, it's not in my notes. <laughs> but as I turn back to John, I just hear, no, go to James. Okay, James chapter 5, verse 14. Is there any sick among you? There doesn't have to be. Is there any sick among you? We might not get many takers right now if we have an altar call for sickness. <laughs> but oh, much better to be humble about your sin. Much better to be humble about your, about your iniquity. Much better to be humble about your transgression and run and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what the man did up at the altar when Jesus was watching. One came up and said, I'm so glad I'm not like that publican down there. I'm just so glad that uh, I'm, not, I'm not like him. And he was on his knees. He was on his knees. And this, this publican, this self-righteous, and he said, he said, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like him down there. I'm a tither. That's what he said. I'm a tither. I attend church twice a week. I say my prayers three times every day. I, 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 me, my. That's what I do. Look at me. I dress up in a nice suit. Look at me. I get here early. Look at me. I, I, I sing in the choir. Look at me. I this, I that, I the other. I tithe. I come to church. I say my prayers. I, I, I work in the community. Yeah, you're a tax collector. You're a thief. Okay, we'll bypass that. We'll just. And he stands there. I'm so glad I'm not like him. What's he do? He won't even lift his face. He won't even lift his eyes to the altar. He's ashamed of himself. And, 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 and he holds on. My pastor's taught me something, you know, about, about being in sin. Uh, and, and he said, you know, the people that keep theirs secret, they're ashamed of it. Yes. Because the other ones brag about theirs. Yes. The other ones wear it like some kind of a badge of honor. Right. I'm living this way and nobody can tell me I can't. And I'm this arrogance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes, wouldn't even lift his eyes to the altar, smote himself on the chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. He said that that's, he's the one that went, went away justified. That, that, that's how you get forgiven. Yeah. First John 1, 9. It is, thank you, Chad. Thank you. You don't have to sit there all day. It's a, unless you need to. <laughs> First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, not cover them up, not make excuses for them. That's what Eve tried to do. That's what is just in the carnal nature. It's not my fault. Wasn't as bad as they said. It only happened once. It was just a little white one. If we confess our sins, that means I sinned. It's what David did. Based off with the prophet, and David said, I've sinned. I have sinned. I have sinned. Then he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of everything not right. Everything not right. So, so are we still in James? Watch James. Watch, 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 watch. Verse 14. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. 
anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's pretty specific, isn't it? We'll talk about specifics in just a moment. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Pray over him. Number two, anoint him with oil. Number three, do that in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, the King James Bible says, save the sick, other translations, and the, the, the margin of my study Bible here says, and the prayer of faith will result in healing for the sick. And the Lord will raise them up. Not the elders. Amen. Not the prayer. The Lord will raise them up. And what are the next two words? No, just the next two words. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. Yeah. What's this word right here? Yeah. Louder. Yeah. Like I want to hear you. Yeah. Thank you. If. I just did that for your benefit so you could emphasize all sickness is not a result of sin. But if they have sinned, they'll be forgiven as well. Yes, there is some physical condition in some lives that is a result of sin. We'd have to deny uh, a lot of the uh, other places in the Bible uh, to, uh, to see that. Jesus, he, he, he healed one person and then he said, now go your way and... Do what? Sin no more. Sin no more. If you sin, just quit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it was terrible. Don't do it again. Amen. Well, you don't know what it was. I don't have to. That's right. That's right. Just don't do it again. Yeah. Just don't do it again. Does sin equal a physical condition? <clears throat> not always. If, he said, if they've sinned. He said, for this reason, some are weak and sickly. Not, not everyone who's weak and sickly or have died. No, no. His disciples, they were, remember from last week, they, they wanted to know the cause. Yeah. Jesus focused on the purpose. Yeah. Yeah. People always want to know the cause. Investigators. Church investigators, <laughs> detectives in the body of Christ, got to find out, going to find out why this happened. So, 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 so they came to Jesus and they said, all right, this blindness, it's a result of whose sin? His parents or this man? We, we talked about it. Wait, guys, guys, you just said he was born blind. And you're now asking the Lord, please reveal to us, was it this man's sin? Who did he rob in the womb? How, how, did, he, how, did, he, how did he commit sacrilege and worship an idol before he was born? He was born blind. And, and, but, but they just, inquiry minds, want to know. They want to know all the details. You know, if it's in our day, they wouldn't even have to ask Jesus. They would just went on social media. He said neither. Now, we gave you a different translation. Uh, do you still have that? Just of Jesus' answer, he said neither. Neither. We're back in John chapter 9. Everybody that works in, this, in the AV booth here ought to get a, ought to get a great reward in heaven yes. for having to try to follow me around the Bible. <laughs> there it is. There it is, the, uh, the uh, contemporary English version. No, it wasn't. Because they asked, was it this man's sin or was it his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said in this translation, no, it wasn't. King James, he said, neither. So here he just says, no, it wasn't. But because of his blindness, you will see God work a miracle for him. Now, this is in the true sense. This is a miracle. Now, we'll read. We'll get, we'll get to every step along the way. But how about this? this? This man said he's minding his own business. He doesn't even ask a question like, who is it that's walking by like blind Bartimaeus? 
He didn't do like the two blind men that followed Jesus all the way across town in Matthew chapter 9, crying out. He, he just stopped and said, what is it that you'll have me do for you? He, he, this man's just minding his own business, sitting outside the temple, and somebody starts rubbing mud on his face. <laughs> and tells him, now wash your face, you filthy, you got mud all over you, go wash it off. And he just did it. And they said, uh, who was it? Well, how would I know? I was blind. Well, what did he look like? Duh! Some man just rubbed mud in my eyes and told me to go wash it off. I'd have loved to have seen Peter and John. I mean, Peter was embarrassed at the little girl. I wonder how embarrassed he's getting now. He's making mud and rubbing it on the guy's face. He's blind already, and now you're putting mud in his eyes. One great, great, great step toward your Christian maturity is when you just embrace that you don't have to figure everything out and that God knows exactly what he's doing And if he sets things in order in his word for the church, for the New Testament church, he knows what he's doing. And if he sets things in order in the family, in the marriage, he just knows what he's doing. You don't have to be able to figure it out, understand what he does. If he sets a financial plan in place that indicates the first tenth, he, he, he knows what he's doing. If he sets this infilling with his spirit to be accompanied by a prayer language that you can't understand and can't figure, he knows what he's doing. If he says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary, if he says, approach him, if he says, come boldly to the throne of grace, if he says, you pray in this name, if he gives you instructions about training up and raising up children, he knows what he's doing. That's right. Amen. He knows exactly what he's doing. And you don't have to. Amen. And you don't have to. Amen. Who sinned? <clears throat> Did the man sin? Did his parents sin? Was it one of their sins? And, and they're, they're, again, they're, they're, they're focusing on the cause. And he says, no, it wasn't. But because of this blindness, you'll see God work a miracle for him. And then he says, <clears throat> I love this verse. Uh, we used to say it a different way. When I grew up, uh, I, I grew up on a dairy farm, and we said it this way. Make hay while the sun shines. Plant corn while the sun shines. Combine oats when the sun shines. Do everything while the sun shines. Because sooner or later, the sun's not going to shine. And then you can do all kinds of inside stuff and maintenance and, and, and do all that when it's not. Because you're going to work around the clock anytime on, a, on that dairy farm. Uh, <clears throat> Make hay while the sun shines is just a paraphrase of this verse. Work while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. And again, lack of any type of lighting whatsoever meant when the sun went down, you're not going to work in the fields. You're not going to work out in the, in the pastures. You're not going to work outside. You're not going to work inside except by a candle or a, 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 a lantern. So he said, <clears throat> he said, while it's day, in other words, while I have opportunity, I believe totally, completely, I, 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 I am thoroughly persuaded and fully convinced that there will be a lot of disappointment in heaven. I'm convinced of it because of what the Bible says about wiping tears from people's eyes. And because of what 1 Corinthians 3 teaches, that our lives, all of them, will go through the fire. And every work will be judged according to what manner it truly was. Gold, silver, Precious stones, they all survive fire. Wood, hay, and stubble, none of which survive fire. I was sat by a number of of dying people's bedsides. 
and I'm waiting for the first one that doesn't express regret. I'm waiting for the very first one that doesn't express regret for not taking more opportunities to say I love you, to do kind things for needy people. We have one go around in this life. If there are things you're waiting to do, waiting to say, waiting to t tell someone how precious they are to you, waiting to share the gospel with someone that's your near neighbor, coworker, classmate, don't wait. Don't, don't, don't put it off. The night is coming. You're not going to have any more opportunity. Do what you can with what you have right where you're at. Do it right now. He said, we have to work while it's day. The night comes when no man will work. <clears throat> Your life will have a, 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 a final moment. Your life will have a final day. And after that, there'll be no more opportunities to witness. There'll be no more opportunities to serve in the ministry of helps. There'll be no more opportunities to pray. Those opportunities are afforded us today in the here and now Work while you can. Make hay while the sun shines. Pass out tracts and pray for the lost while you have time now. The night's coming when no man will work. And then he said, I'm the light of the world as long as I'm here. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Who's the light of the world now? Uh, we are. We are. And we gave those verses in closing last week. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. And Philippians 2 12 through 16, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 6, when he had spoken that, he spit in the ground. Now, I want you to see a, a careful examination of this verse is that this was initiated by God, not by humans. It was perpetuated by God. And yet there was some level of human involvement in that the man had to do something. Does it say anything about prayer was being offered for the man? Did the man start to call out and cry out? Did, was the man praying and fasting, waiting for the Lord to do something for him? No, not at all. What was happening? He was, he was, he was, he was just there. And Jesus was walking out of church. He was just leaving the temple, and they were following him with stones. And he noticed this man, and the disciples asked, who sinned? Who sinned? We want to know who sinned. And he said, nobody sinned, but you're going to see a miracle. And he spit in the ground and made clay out of the spittle and rubbed it on the blind man, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He saw the man, answered their question, and then spit. Paul, I told you spitting was biblical. <laughs> Probably made trouble for about 80, 90% of the moms in here with little boys now. No, Jesus spit. Now, had Jesus ever spit? At any other time in the Bible? Jesus, I mean, some people, they, they, I'm surprised there hadn't been a book out. The Spitting Ministry of Jesus. <laughs> look, back at, look back at the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, the Spitting Ministry of Jesus. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. And departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the coast of the Capitalists, and they brought one to him who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. So he was deaf and he had difficulty, challenge in, in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. Isn't that like humans? Always good. Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to tell. This is God in their midst, and they're going to tell him what he needs to do. Yeah. Oh my. Oh my. They brought one and, and asked him to put his hand on him. 
And Jesus took him aside. Make special note of this, because sometimes you have to get away from unbelief. He took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears, and spit and touched his tongue. And looked up to heaven and sighed and said, F. And that is, be open. Immediately his ears were open and his tongue was loosed and he spake plainly. And he spake plainly. Stick your tongue out. <laughs> Listen, Jesus, I'm not sure I'm up for this. Yeah. Well, you want to you you talk or you want to you mumble your whole life? Did he spit? Yes, he did. Did the man talk? Yes, he did. What do you care? <laughs> Chapter 8. Chapter 8. Now, this is a blind man. Verse 22. He came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and besought him to touch him. Here we go again. We know what the Lord needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Now, the last one, he just had to get him away from that group of people. Here he gets him all the way out of the community. And when he had spit in his eyes, <laughs> anybody want to come up for prayer this morning? <laughs> He's spit in his eyes. Spit in the man's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> spit in his eyes. <laughs> and put his hand on him and asked him if he could see anything. He looked up and said, I see men. It's blurry. They're like trees walking. I can see shapes. And he put his hands on him, on his eyes. Now notice that. It put his hands on his eyes. He put his hands on his eyes. He didn't spit on his forehead. He spit in his eyes. And he put his hands on his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. We know, we, we, we know a few things about the power of God. What we know we learn from our Bible and what we see in our Bible <clears throat> is that in the, in, the realm, in the spiritual realm, in the supernatural realm, in the eternal realm, in the realm where God, uh, the Holy Spirit, the angels, where they exist, that we don't contact with our five physical senses, in, in that realm, the glory of God exists. And it breaks through into this realm at times, and somewhat similar to electricity there are laws that govern its transference. We have light and we have air conditioning uh, in, this, in this building today. Uh, we had sound coming through speakers and being amplified, uh, all because electricity was discovered and, and the discoveries were made into how it was transferred, how it could be generated, how it could be stored, and how it could be utilized. Thomas Edison, of course, is given credit for the incandescent light bulb, and, and, and they said he failed 10,000 times trying, just trying to get just one little light bulb to light up and not blow up or burn out, and 10,000 exercises until he got it right. Something about the power of God, similar again to electricity, electricity will not be transferred through glass. That's why they make glass insulators, and, and, and glass won't, won't, won't transmit electricity. Wood won't transmit electricity. Won't do it. Take a wooden hammer handle and walk right up to that electric fence and push that fence down with that wood handle and step right over there and never get shocked. Or you can not realize that dad bought a new hammer with a metal handle and try the same thing and realize that metal transmits and transfers electricity, conducts electricity pretty well. Some metal better than others. 
from the Bible, we read that cloth seems to be a carrier or container of, of, of the anointing. Elijah left his mantle. Elisha picked it up and said, where is the God of Elisha? And took that same mantle and struck the, struck the river and, and, and it parted hither and thither. Jesus, when he walked through the crowd, they were touching the hem of his garment. They weren't touching the bottom of his sandals. Hem of his garment. Paul, in Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, it says they took pieces of cloth, handkerchiefs or, or, or aprons, just, just pieces of cloth, and, and he, he, he'd be preaching away and teaching away, and the anointing is always strongest on any minister, not when he's grocery shopping, not when he's at a baseball game. Uh, the anointing is, is strongest on any minister when he's ministering. That's when, that's when the, 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 the power of God is most present. And they would take those and they would carry them back and put them on sick people and demon-possessed people. And those demons would shriek and leave and, the, and their sicknesses and diseases would, would, would depart from them. We don't have any evidence ever in the Bible of, of the anointing being stored in paper or plastic or metal, but only in in, in cloth. Here, Jesus spits in the man's eyes. You both have glasses on. You don't have glasses. Come up here. Ah, look at this hesitation. My spit's anointed. His was. Spit right in the man's eyes. Spit right in his eyes. Stick your tongue out. And he spit and touched his tongue. And it's going to it's going, to, it's going to just sit there and it's going to last. It's going to be an application of the anointing as opposed to just a brush off, just a, just a, just a brush alongside. It's going to stay there. Now, now he spits in the dirt. And that spit is, along with that dirt, being molded into some type of a paste. And he's going to rub that right on that man's eyes. I don't know if they were open or closed. I don't know if he made little balls of that and stuck it right in the man's eye sockets. And it's going to stay there. And that anointing is going to penetrate and permeate and continue its work. And then he says to the man, now you look at any map you want to. You look and see how far it is from the temple all the way over to the pool of Siloam. And walking there is going to take the man 20 to 30 minutes minimum, and he's blind. Might take him an hour, might take him an hour and a half, might take him two hours, might take him all afternoon. Gives us no indication in that book whatsoever how long it took that man to go. How many people would just argue? Yeah. There's, a, there's a garden hose right there. There's water right inside the door of the temple, right inside the door. I'm, I'm sitting right out here, out here, right inside the door, there's water. Why can't I wash there? Nobody would say that, Pastor. The Lord says, turn back to 2 Kings. Huh, 2 Kings chapter 5. Are there not Abinar and Parfar rivers in Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? Why can't I just go wash there and be whole? What happened here? Here's a man who has leprosy. Leprosy. And he's got a, he, they, they, they had a little girl serving in his household. And she said, too bad you're not in Israel. There's a prophet over there. He could heal you of leprosy. He's a man of God. And our God can heal anything. And so he went over. And he, he went up and he knocked on the door. He knocked on the door. In verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in Jordan. Seven times and your flesh shall come again and you'll be clean. And instead of saying, well, if that's what the Lord says, then that's what I'll do. If the Lord says that's what to do, uh, uh, with, with for, forgive everyone of everything, then bless the Lord, that's what I'm going to do. If the Lord says humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, then that's what I'm going to do. 
if the Lord says be reverent and respectful to all leaders for the Lord's sake, then that's what I'm going to do. If the Lord says don't forsake assembling together with believers uh, when, the, when the church house is open, then that's what I'm going to do. If the Lord speaks to me as a wife, as a husband, as a parent, then that's what I'm going to do. Why do I have to do it that way? Uh -oh. You see, see, this wasn't God speaking to him. This was Elisha. Well, if God would speak to me, I'd do it. But I'm not going to do it because you say so, pastor. Oh. Help yourself. Stay a leper. I'm just trying to help you. You know, Bishop, <clears throat> when the Lord called me to pastor, now I can speak pretty freely about it now. Uh, I did at the 40th anniversary celebration. But uh, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think anyone would believe me. Who's going who's gonna to believe a 24-year-old farm kid that I was walking across the hayfield in the morning and I heard the voice of the eternal God? Felt to me like it tumbled down through the sky. <clears throat> moved to La Crosse and pastor Living Word Church. That was it. Who's going to believe that? Who's going to believe a, uh, uh, that, that, that on the 23rd of August 1985 that all the earth suspended <clears throat> and I watched the call float down out of the heavens and, and rest and settle right on me and I heard God's voice Say, I've called you and I've anointed you as a pastor over a flock of my sheep, shepherd over a flock of my sheep, pastor in my body. Go forth and you'll never again doubt that call. Oh, nobody's going to believe that. Nobody's going to believe me. Wouldn't share it with anybody. You can know you're called, and you can know you're anointed, and you can know you're speaking on behalf of the king of eternity. And say, stand up, turn around three times, lay down on the floor, and take off running. And, and just have people argue with you and fuss with you and say, I don't want to do that, and you can't make me, and you can't tell me what to do. Stay a leper. Because I've told the people, get up out of that chair and, 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 and walk around the sanctuary, and they can't walk two steps. They can't, they can't breathe. And you can tell, you can tell when, they're, when, when you know heaven is speaking, and they're looking at you like this, and they go, and they stand up to their feet, and, 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 and they take those first steps and just start stumbling. And, and, but if, they, if, they'll just, if they'll just do it, if they will just do what the Lord says to do and not argue and not have it, have it make sense and not have to have their own selfish, arrogant, childish way. Then heaven moves. Were you in that service when that little girl took off? Come around the second time, I said, do it again. She's red in the face, panting, breathing, grasping her chest. She walked again. Third time, I said, now run this time. Oh. I jumped off the platform, ran with her all the way around. Came around, totally, 100%, completely healed. Sat there in oxygen in, 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 in the front of her, sat there with, 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 with oxygen. With oxygen. Jesus looked at a person with a withered hand. I mean, all, all shriveled up and shrunk up. And he said, stretch that hand out whole. Yeah. I mean, you can argue with him all you want about, I shouldn't have to do that. I'm not a second-class citizen. Why should I have to submit? Just, just reach your hand out and be whole. Or, or stay crippled. Go, go, go dip in the River Jordan seven times. Not six, not five. Why seven? How come I can't just dip once? <laughs> really? <laughs> Isn't this hard? We've got rivers back in, back in Damascus that are cleaner than that old mud slop hole.
and, 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 and his servants. None of these people were saved. But he had some good people around him. Verse 13. And his servants came and spoke and said, if the prophet had bid some difficult thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more if he said, wash and be clean? And so he went down, dipped seven times, totally healed. Totally healed. Jesus spit in the ground. He made clay of the spittle. He rubbed it on the blind man's eyes. And then he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He didn't say Jericho. He didn't say the first water you find. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Nothing different about that water. Just took him time to get there. And he had to obey. And he went and washed and came again seeing. Do you remember? He, he did what? He went and washed and came again seeing. What did he do? He went and he washed and he came again seeing. Did exactly what he was told. I'm going to say that again. He did exactly as he was told. Now, one of my highlighted and, and uh, uh, I mean, the thing is all marked up. I got arrows pointing to it and I got, and, and that's, and that's uh, I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read this verse to you. Don't put it up. I know you don't have these, these verses, so just, just, just let me share. That Ezra chapter 7, verse 23. Ezra 7 and verse 23. The American Standard Bible says this. If you have one, you can read along. If not, just listen. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done exactly. The English Revised Version. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done exactly. God's Word translation. Whatever the God of heaven has commanded must be carried out in detail. The JPS Tanuk translation. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done exactly. The New American Bible. Let everything that is decreed by God be carried out exactly. The New English Testament, everything that the God of heaven has required should be precisely done. And the word English Bible, whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done exactly. See, you can't substitute, you can't substitute your way for God's way. We, we don't get past the third page in our Bible before we see that. We see Abel and we see Cain. And we see God commanding them. And we see one bringing what God expected and what God required. And we see the other doing what he wanted and bringing what he wanted and presenting what he wanted. And we see it all the way, all the way through that, that testament. And the last uh, book of that testament, Malachi, we see the same thing. We see people weren't bringing their best. They were bringing their worst. They were bringing their rotten and their lame and their sickly. Uh, and they're moldy, and that's what they wanted to give. Well, they had substituted their own desires and their own wishes and called it obedience, and the Lord called it disobedience because they weren't doing exactly as he had said. Find out what God says that addresses your situation, and then just do it exactly. Amen. And then just do it precisely. And then just perform it in detail. Do it exactly. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12, if you remember this, this is where Moses, uh, he, he, he's, he's got the rock, and the rock is here, and the people are chiding him, and he's getting frustrated with them again. And the first time he had taken the staff, remember what he did? He struck the rock, and water came out. What's, what's the difference this time? This time the Lord told him, speak to the rock in front of these people that I may be glorified, and, and water will come out. And instead, he, he, he did what? He walked over and he struck the rock twice and water came out and God was compassionate and all of those people survived. But notice what he says to Moses right here. He said to Moses, because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you'll not bring this congregation in the land that I've given them. And one of those translations that I just read from one of those says, because you did not obey me exactly. Because you did not obey me exactly. You didn't do what I said. Here, Jesus says to the man, 
go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he did it. And he did it. One of the greatest principles we're going to take away from this entire series on the miracles of Jesus was given to us in the first miracle. And that's John chapter 2. And the second part of the fifth verse, she says, whatever he says to do, do that. Yeah, whatever he says to do, do that. In any situation you want to name in life, whatever the Lord says to do, do that. Yeah. The best advisement I can give you as a pastor is whatever the Lord tells you to do, do that. Amen. Do that. Amen. The best teaching I can give you as a teacher is whatever the Lord says to do, do that. Amen. Just do that. Just do that. And he came again seeing. His neighbors, therefore, and they that, were, that had seen him <clears throat> that was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? And others said, it's like him, but he said, I'm he, it's me, it's me. Therefore, they said unto him, how were your eyes open? How were your eyes open? And he said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. Or broke the unit, one. I'll use this one. I've only got two hours left, so. You better shut this one off. Otherwise, it'll kick back on and... Bobby double! <laughs> and go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he did it. And then he told everybody else about it, too. He testified. He didn't say, well, this is kind of private. I don't know if I can share it with you. He testified. He testified. He testified. Don't be afraid to share the great things that the Lord has done with you. Starting, starting with, with, you know, I, I was a lost cause and a lost case, and the Lord drew me to himself and, and, and showed me that he loved me and he cared about me. And, and, and I prayed he saved me, and that two-ton weight rolled off me. And, and, and I, now I have the assurance I'm right with God. And, and, and start there. Start. Tell, tell how he filled you with his spirit. Tell how he healed you. Tell how he mentioned you. Tell how he miraculously supplied and provided. Tell how you're never alone because you're you're always con conscious of his presence with you. Tell your story. Yeah. Yours is the one you know best. And, and, and don't ever be ashamed and, and tell it. Now, point number two there. Everyone will not believe your story. And there are those who will not appreciate your story. Okay, we just, uh, you, now we're going to, I'm going to read fast. I'm going to read fast, but I'm going to read the rest of what's written here. Ready? He said that a man named Jesus made clay and anointed his eyes. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And, and I washed and I received my sight. And they said, where is he? He said, I don't know. And they brought him to the Pharisees that, that before had been blind. And it was the Sabbath day that Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And when the Pharisees asked how he received his sight, he said, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say of him that opened your eyes? He said, I, I think he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he'd been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked, is this your son? Was he born blind? How does he now see? And the parents said, we know this is our son. We know he was born blind. By what man, manner he now sees, we don't know. Or who has opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. These words spoke the parents because they were so bold. Oh, no, no, no. No, because they were afraid of the Jews. They had agreed already if any man confessed he was the Christ, he'd be thrown out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So they called the blind man in again. Oh, brother. And they said, give God praise. We know this man is a sinner. He said, whether he's a sinner or no, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. 
So you don't have to have all the answers and have everything figured out. All I know is once I was lost and now I'm, now I'm set free. Now, once I was blind, blind and now I see. Once I was poor and beggarly and didn't have enough and now I live in the land of more than enough. All I know, all I know is I, I, I was a wreck and, 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 and he made me whole. He said, I don't know. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And they said to him again, what did he to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I've told you already and you didn't hear. Why would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? And they reviled him and they said, you're his disciple. We're Moses' disciples. We know God spoke of Moses. For this fellow, we don't know where he is. And the man answered and said, here's a marvelous thing that you don't know from whence he is and yet he has opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he hears. Since the world began, it was never heard that a man born blind should have his eyes open. And if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said, you were born in sins and you teach, teach us. And they threw him out of their church. And they threw him out of their church. Now, th this, I mean, this is terrible. This is awful that the man is, he, he's not even praying. He's not fasting. He's not at some charismatic tent revival. He's sitting outside of the temple begging like he's supposed to do. He's a blind man. He's got authorization to do that. He was examined by these very Pharisees and, and given, given an opportunity to do that. And then somebody rubs mud in his face and says, now go wash off in the pool of Siloam. And he just does it. There are people who will just obey God and just do what he says. And, and, and he just does it and he, his sight is restored. He can see for the first time in his life. He's happy. Can you imagine how happy you'd be? You'd never seen your whole life. And now he can see and, and, and he's just so elated and he gets persecution from the religious folk for receiving something from God. Now, there's only, there's only one account in the Bible that, that I think trumps this one. And that's in chapter 11. That's going to be our next miracle. This is going to be next week's lesson. Next week's lesson, you remember what happens in John chapter 11? What happens? I mean, the whole chapter is about Lazarus and Lazarus' two sisters. And they're sending a letter to Jesus. And they need him to come right now. And he sits down and waits. <laughs> Takes a four-day weekend and then decides to go. And, and when he gets there, they, they, they come right up. If you'd have been here, you wouldn't have died. And, and, and he said, roll away the stone. They said, well, he stinks. <laughs> Didn't I tell you if you'd believe, you'd see the glory of God? And he calls down in that hole and says, Lazarus, come out. And, and, and Lazarus comes out. Just take the grave clothes off. He, he's, he's bound. Loose him. Set him free. And he, he's loose and set him free. Now, what's the religious folk in the community? The religious folk in the community, what's their response? That's chapter 11. Look at chapter 12. In chapter 12, Mary is going to anoint Jesus. And of course, he gets criticized because she pours out this extravagantly expensive gift on him and gets criticized over it. Why wasn't this sold and the money given to the poor? That sounds so spiritual, don't it? The thief who was stealing out the bag said it. He said, leave her alone. Seven, leave her alone. Against the day of my burial, she kept this. The poor you have always with you. Me, you don't have always. Verse nine, many people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came, not for Jesus' sake, but also they came to see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. Now look at verse 10 and 11. Look carefully. We're about done. Don't give out now. Ready? But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death because by the reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Man, you're a dead guy. You're a dead man. You're laying in the tomb all wrapped up in white, you know, your feet and your toes and your fingers and your hands and your face and everything, and you're dead. 
and you hear this powerful voice booming and everything is shaking and it says, come out here. And you just come out the only way you can, hopping out of that grave in those grave clothes. And they said, loose him now, get him out of that mess and, and let him go. Those grave clothes stink. Get him out of that. Get him out of that. Get him out of that. We try to do that every Sunday with, and just get you out of some of those old grave clothes. Some of you just got one little piece hanging here, one little piece hanging there. We're trying to get it off you. It stinks. And then what do the, what do the religious folk in the, in the town want to do? They want to kill him for getting raised from the dead. I had no part of it. I was having a nap. I was, I was relaxed. Blessed are they that die in the Lord. They rest from their labors. I, I was, and, 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 and all of a sudden I heard this voice and I get up and now people want to kill me. They didn't think this through. He died already, and it didn't work. <laughs> you want to kill him again? <laughs> Religious, religion is nuts. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> and the religious people, they want to kill Lazarus, because people believe in Jesus because of what happened in Lazarus' life. Some people will just not be impressed with your testimony. They won't be happy that God rescued you. They won't be happy that he delivered you. They won't be happy that he healed you. They won't be happy that he empowered you. They won't be happy that he prospered you. They won't be happy that he set you free. They won't be happy that he promoted you. They won't be happy that he raised you up. They won't be happy unless you're back to what you used to be with them. And you aren't going back. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. Amazing God's amazing grace. Now let's finish it up. Let's finish it up. Finish up chapter 9, Pastor. All right, get back there. Finish up chapter 9. Now watch this. Now watch this. After they excommunicate him, after they kick him out of their church because he received a miracle, people get kicked out of their church for being born again. Want to tell everybody, I got born again. Ah, we don't believe that here in this church. Well, Jesus said, oh, we don't care about what Jesus said. We don't believe that in our church. Well, Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, we don't, we, we, we don't believe that. Don't say that in this church or you're going to have to leave. We're going to kick you out for getting born again. Hey, pastor, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't believe that in this church. You spout that around here. We're just going to kick you out of this church for getting, for getting, for getting something from God. For getting something from God. Well, <clears throat> pastor, uh, you, you know I was born with that. And you know I've suffered with that my whole life. But God healed me this week. Don't tell anybody we don't believe in that. You ought to tell everybody. God is on the move. God is alive. God is still the God of the Bible. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Forget about what we believe. We believe wrong, apparently. Not the only thing we believe wrong. The Bible says we only know a part of everything. How can we claim we know anything in its totality? We can't, except in arrogance. Yeah, we know in part. And the part we know that's revealed to us that we can grasp is that God, our God, never changes. He's the same, and, 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 and the flower withers and, 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 and passes away, but the Word of God stands forever. And He hasn't changed one iota. He says, I, Malachi 3, 6, am the Lord, I change not. James 1, 17, not even a shadow of change in God, not even a shadow of turning in God. He's the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and, and here you got, you got two men, one, one who's raised from the dead. And they don't only want to kick him out of the church, they want to kill him. And this one who was born blind and now he can see, and instead of celebrating it and getting him up on Sunday morning, say, tell your testimony to everybody. Share with everybody what happened to you. Instead of doing that, they kick him out. They boot him out. (laughs) 
But his parents got to stay. Isn't that sweet? No love like a mother's love. <laughs> she didn't care what happened to him. She wanted to stay a member of XYZ Church. She got to, and her son got kicked out. But watch what happens to her son. And they kicked him out of the church. Verse 34. They cast him out of the synagogue. Verse 35. Jesus heard about it. I said, Jesus heard about it. Jesus knows what church you got kicked out of or asked not to come back to. Jesus heard who's not happy with your testimony because you got saved, healed, delivered, set free, filled with God. He heard all about it. Jesus heard about it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he pays attention to those he does miracles in their lives. He heard they'd cast him out, and he went and found him, searched him out. He became the detective. He, he found out where he lived. He sought after him till he found him, the man that had been kicked out. Probably put his arm around him and said, they chased me out with rocks last time, by the way, so you feel better. When Jesus heard about it, that they'd cast him out, he went and found him. And he said, do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he? Lord, that I may believe on him. And Jesus said, you have seen him. And it is he who is talking with you right now. And he said, Lord, I believe. And got down on his knees and worshiped him got down on his knees and worshiped him. Number one, Jesus came and found him. Number two, Jesus revealed himself to him and who he really and truly is. And number three, he worshiped Jesus. Got down on his knees. Jeremiah 29 says, I will be found of you. I will reveal myself. I'll unveil myself to you. I'll open your eyes. I'll pull back the veil. And I'll allow you to find me when you search for me with your whole heart. You search for me with your whole heart, and I'll allow myself to be found of you. Jesus went to that man and unveiled himself. The people that say, well, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. They never read the Bible. He did right there. I'm the one talking to you right now. And he fell on his knees, got right down on his knees. That's what worship means. It doesn't mean they played a slow song and he's saying, Lord, you are more. He, he got down on his knees. He worshiped him, got right down and worshiped the Lord. Got right down and worshiped the Lord. And, 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 and then Jesus responded and, and, and continued on. And he said, for judgment, I am come to the world. That they which see might see not, and they which see not might see. The Pharisees that heard these words said, are we blind also? Jesus said, if you were, you'd have no sin. But because you say we see, your sin remains. Jesus came to help us see. Keep us to not, 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 not walk around with any, any level of, of blindness. The greatest things your eyes will ever see is not something that these physical, circular devices that point out the front of your face will look at, but what the eyes of your heart will see. The eyes of your heart will see that our God is greater than all. That there is a living God. He exists everywhere in the person of His Spirit. He has a plan for, for you. It doesn't matter if everyone rejects you when He accepts you. You can be persecuted for some, some good thing or some great thing that the Lord has done. Might even get excommunicated from a club or a group or a company, or in his case, a church. 
but much more important, your walk with the living Lord and the living Savior. I'd love to know the, the rest of that man's story. I'd love to have a history book that said, and then this is what happened. Here's, here's, here, here's how he went on. We don't have. Maybe the story would be sad. Maybe it would be a story like Zacchaeus or Cornelius, both of whom became servants of God and, and uh, devoted and dedicated their lives. I can't help but think about those ten lepers in the book of Luke. That <clears throat> They came, the Lord did something wonderful, miraculous, and powerful for all ten of them, and one came back. Remember that? One came back and worshipped him. One came back and worshipped him. But even him, the Lord didn't reveal himself to. He received his worship, but he did not reveal himself to him. This is a really, really special moment in the Bible when this man is thrown out and Jesus goes and finds him and reveals, I am the Son of God, and accepts his worship. Lord, we're grateful, so appreciative and so thankful that you came and found us. And we don't take credit for that. Your, your, your word says you came to seek and save those who are lost. That you, Heavenly Father, drew us. As the scripture says, no man can come except he's drawn of my Father. And Lord Jesus, you opened the eyes of our heart, which were afore blinded by the God of this world. And our eyes were open to the need that every human has of a Redeemer, of a Savior. We can't redeem ourselves. We can't pay for our own sin. There's nothing we can do to bring us into right standing with God. Nothing. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done. But according to your mercy, you saved us. Lord, we are ever grateful, always grateful, eternally grateful for your great salvation that you've provided us and are continuing to open our eyes to. Grace each one here, Lord, I pray. Everyone listening and watching today, with a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of yourself, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Continue to bring that about and perform that, I pray, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin. On Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.